capability that is showing up. Um, so you guys provided some great guiding questions for the presentation. That's why we knew to have Jamie and Lance on. Uh, so we're going to start with navigating the website. I'm going to let Jamie take over from there, although I will be driving the slideshow if I can figure out how to do that. Let me move to a different slide. But Jamie, if you're ready, I would go ahead and I will. I'm get... ready. So I think if I just do my share screen, I'm going to. Can everybody see the website now? No, it, it was there and then it and then it left again. Michael so had it up. I was doing the sharing on that one. Okay, how about now you it, Jamie? There we go. Okay. Um, well, as Michael said, my name is Jamie Abraham. Just a little bit of background. I've been with the office 22 years now. So I've been in a lot of the real estate um, divisions. Um, right now I'm with our operations IT. So um so what we're going to um, start with first is, does everybody have our mobile app? If not, I recommend going to the um, Google store or the um, Apple store and downloading it. You can do it by simply going search and do Franklin County Auditor. Um, so from there, what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about one of um, my favorite features on the, um, the website, which is under our online tools. Um, you can access it from the, the main page by simply clicking in the top right corner our online tools and scrolling down to our data and reporting. And this is a web reporter feature. So if you're looking to do um, custom queries, inquires, um, here's a full download of our entire database as far as like tax accounting and appraisal stuff goes. Um, and you can narrow everything down by using um, filters. Um, you can do filters by taxing districts, school districts, um, cities, zip codes, um, neighborhoods, um, owners, um, dwelling information as stories, bedrooms. Um, there's a lot of good stuff. Transfer sales. If you're looking to find, you know, properties that are in between a certain market value. Um, this is an awesome tool to, to use and it um, exports into um, Excel so you can just download it um, and have a file ready for your use. Um, I was gonna walk through just um, a simple one for you. Um, the, the starting point is always um, gonna output your parcel number and it's going to start with the standard um, parcel counts in the county. We have around 437,000 parcel records. Um, so what you want to try to do is narrow it down so you're not working with the entire uh, giant file. Um, so for example, if we want to find parcels that are within a certain school district, um, we can select school district um, and filter, and then it'll prompt us to select a school district that we're interested in. So if we want to do um, New Albany schools, um, I'll select New Albany, I'll apply my filters. And now I'm just working with a set of parcels that are in New Albany school districts. And it, it decreased down to around 7,700. Um, going from there, if I want to add, I want to look at the sales between a certain date and a certain price for this New Albany school district, I can select a filter and I can go January 1st through and it's current as of the day before. So it's current through uh, March 24th because um, this updates nightly, uh, 2021, apply filters. Then I'm looking at like 900 entries. So depending on what data you're looking for, um, you can select those to output in your criteria. For example, if I want owner information, um, tax information, tax mailing information, select those fields. Um, if I want building information, I can either select all or specific ones. Um, once you have all your selections made, you'll do 
your apply filters again to make sure you're getting all your um, entries into your output. Um, as far as the results go, standard is going to be just a one line output field. So you're only going to get one parcel record. Um, building, there's a discrepancy. You can see 929 versus 966. That means if a parcel has multiple buildings on it and you select the building record, you're going to get multiple rows because it'll be the information for each building type. And then the transfer, that number you can see is a little bit larger. Um, standard will just give you the last transfer on the property within that date range. But if you select transfer, you're going to get all those within that um, specific date range. Um, I'm just going to select standard right now. You'll click it, you'll download report, and it'll output to Excel. And you've got all your data that was in your criteria just at the click of a button. And you can play around with that. Does anybody have any questions? Or is there something certain maybe you would like to see if this can do? Yeah, I was wondering something. Is yes. there a way to search for, like for instance, I've been looking for a piece of land and I thought, wouldn't it be great to find land that hasn't transferred within a certain area like for a long, long time? You know, something that's just been sat on for it forever to do that yes. search. For a certain area, so meaning like a zip code or a neighborhood? Um, how about a map search, is that possible? Um, you could do, sorry, <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm just trying to think if you have, you can do a map search on, so you have the area that you're looking for and you want parcels within that area that um, happens. Yes, yeah, so something that hasn't transferred in forever that maybe somebody's potentially looking to sell that hasn't even thought about it yet. You know, I, I don't know if that even makes sense, but I've just- Yeah, I'm just thinking if you have, if you have that area, um, you could do it by zip code, which would be a mapping okay. area. Uh -huh. um, and okay. by doing that, you could just do, oh my. You could do a zip code and you could do a filter um, and select the, the zip code area that you wanted. Um, right. And if you're looking for just land only, you yeah. would need to um, do all the values and you would kind of have to um, tweak a little just to make sure you're not getting any improvements. So you right. could do, um, select the building criteria and then you would want to also include the sale date. And then that way you'll be able to see the last transfer from right. that. Is that kind of? Yeah, thanks. Um, that's, a, that's a great workaround. Um, being, I think applying the filters is probably the the most telling detailed information that you you can get from that. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can always export the entire. You can go through and select everything, um, but like it's a huge report. So that's why yes, yeah, doing the filters beforehand versus just exporting the entire file and working with it because it's we're a large county. Mm -hmm. And then on the transfer date, you could do valid sale. I'm assuming that comes up with yes or no, and then that would exclude any quick claim deeds or anything like that. Correct, yes. So that's like an actual transfer. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it'll give you the sales type, which I think that's just the land in the building. And that's driven from what was um, selected on the conveyance form. Um, you can do parcel counts. Um, you can also do a sales price from, you know, a penny to, you know, a million. So if you want to exclude the ones that were zero as well. 
So uh -huh. would it would it be fair to say that the market value for improvements would normally be zero if it was only land? Yes. Okay. So if you were looking for lots, that would probably be the easiest way to exclude anything that had like a house on it. If, if there's a barn or something like that, could that be um, an improvement? An improvement? Yeah, it would be listed as what we call an outbuilding and yard in OBY, which is captured in the improvement value. Okay. So maybe set like a $50,000 improvement or something, and that should cover, is that a fair yeah. number usually? I mean, it might be a really sweet barn, but. <laughs> and and you can always get your list and then you know look at those on the site and do the aerial which will show you you know the, yeah. the overview photo of them cool this is this is great i didn't even know this is it existed so this is why we're on this call today yeah well yeah so jamie and her years of expertise they they have great resources i've only been in the office two years and lance a few in between jamie and i um but it's out there and we do appreciate the opportunity to continue to brag about it because it is a great resource and tool. And I don't know, Jamie, if you wanted to brag a little bit more. No, that's good. But if, you know, after we close, you know, this session or whatever, and you have any follow-up, feel free to um, email Michael or I can also give my address as well. And then if you have any, you know, direct questions, I'd be happy to help, so. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. It is one of the kind of things you need to go out and play for it with it a little bit yourself. While Jamie does do a great job of explaining it, it is helpful to kind of see if you're able to find what you're looking for. And if not, having someone then say, well, this, did you add this or eliminate this to the query? Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah, you can't break it, so. <laughs> not that we want that to be a challenge that you pursue either. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Any other um, questions for Jamie or any more you're adding, Jamie? The only thing I was just thinking, um, one easy one to do too, is if you're looking to do like mailing addresses, this is a good tool. If you're looking to, you know, being a realtor, you know, you have, you know, a street name, you want to hit everybody on that street. You can do a filter by, you know, street by the street and then get the, the information as far as owner information or mailing information. It'll export it to Excel for you as well, so. Is there any way um, to figure out, is there a, a filter for non-owner occupant or would yes. you have to use the rental registration? No, there is down here in tax status, it's okay. owner occupied credit and it's um, yes, no. Okay. You just filter cool. up to owner occupied, yes, no. So that will be, that's a, that's a good question. Um, to ask like, how do you know outside of, I mean, of course, when it transfers, the, the, the buyer says, yes, I'm, I'm occupying it, but how does the auditor keep track of who is actually an owner occupant and, you know, who's not registering their properties as rental properties? We send a letter um, and it is on the property owner's initiative to make sure they're complying with the law. Uh, so we just sent a reminder of kind of hot areas that would make sense that they should probably be a rental based on the activity and some uh, deducement on the office side of things. Uh, but if they never get back to us, there isn't much we can do. And then we just kind of wait till we hear from neighbors. Gotcha. Yeah. And it's like this, um, that status is based upon tax lien date. Um, so this is using what we consider our duplicate year. So it's for 1120, the status. So a renter could have purchased or a, um, somebody could have purchased it and it's going to be non-owner occupied the following year. It's just because we're one year in the rears. Gotcha. So. Gotcha. But that's all I have. Um, Thank you, Jamie. Again, if you guys have any follow-up questions, please go out, practice on the tool. I'm going to see, if you unshare your screen, Jamie, then I'm going to try and get back to the PowerPoint scene if I can drive it a little bit. Next will be Lance, though, with the appraisal update. All right, so navigating the website, there are some slides, web reporter. We will send this over to Lisa, and Lisa, you can distribute it out as well. Um, awesome.
that is helpful. Uh, so next piece is appraisal update. Mr. Gates. What? No, get down. All right, good afternoon. I'm Lance Gates. I'm the director of appraisal here at the Franklin County Auditor's Office. Um, I've been with the county now um, for about five years um, this May, and I've been a uh, state certified appraiser in Franklin County, and I've been doing appraisal and real estate since 1995 right here in Franklin County and contiguous counties. So very familiar with our county. Um, and uh, so, I, so when I, uh, I used to have my own appraisal firm, and then I converted when the market crashed and uh, started to crash in 05, 06, 07, all those fun years where the market started to change, I started getting into the ad valorem tax appraising, which is mass appraisal. So briefly, I wanna just kind of show you some differences between mass appraisal and, and fee appraisal. But overall, you have to understand that the same concepts happen. We still use the cost approach, the income approach, comparable sales approach. The theory of appraisal is still the same, however, um, we do it in a mass amount, right? We have to appraise 430,000 parcels basically as an effective date of each reappraisal or each year, um, depending on what's going on. So let's talk, um, we'll talk a couple of different things. Mass appraisal, um, one of the biggest thing is when we do our reappraisals, we look at sales over the last three years for the effective date of the appraisal. So for example, our last reappraisal was in 2017. We looked at the sales from 15, 16, and 17 to determine the values as of 1117. So we look at a lot of sales, whereas on the fee side, you know, you all have experienced a fee appraiser going into the property. Um, typically they will look at the sales in the last six months um, instead of a three year history. Um, Again, they get to access the property, property, property. Sorry, uh, typically. Whereas we do the majority of our work from aerial photography, drive by. We do access properties occasionally. Um, we don't get into the properties, but we are a lot of times we'll measure the house from the exterior, um, new builds, um, any type of additions, any things like that. Um, we will uh, actually measure the house. Um, now with COVID going on, it's been a little different. We don't have a lot of folks in the field right now. We're using our aerial photography um, and that aerial photography allows us to measure within six, six inches of the house. So we're pretty accurate even with our technology that we have. Um, back to mass appraisal, our reappraisal takes probably two and a half, two to two and a half years to accomplish because of the volume that we have. Um, and then, uh, Whereas your fee appraisers, you know, you've got a turnaround time of 48 to 72 hours. Um, what it really boils down to is our, ours is a large project, but our theories are the same as far as the approaches that we use. Um, and you can see at the very bottom, uh, you know, the, you know, a fee appraisal is ranging between, you know, $400, $500. On average, based on our large project, we appraise about $21 a parcel when the whole project's all said and done. Next, we're going to talk about the actual reappraisal and the triennial. The reappraisal happens every six years. Our last one was in 2017. So we're, getting, we're actually starting to get ready to start our 2023 reappraisal. Um, our triennial update happens every, the three years in between the reappraisals, which we just completed in, as of 1-1-2020. That was our triennial update. Two differences between these two processes. The triennial is an update and the reappraisal is a full blown reappraisal, which means we are reanalyzing land, the improvements. Um, we do a, um, additional delineation of neighborhoods in the area. Um, you think of neighborhoods, how they sell, we look at them a little bit different as under appraisal neighborhoods. Um, so we're looking at uh, homogeneous areas that are com competing against each other, we might have larger neighborhoods than just a subdivision. So during this time frame, um, the reappraisal, typically we do a lot of uh, use of our aerial technology. Um, we do a desktop review and then what we can't see, we actually field inspect then. So we might have somebody 
um, knocking on the door, can, uh, you know, maybe if their property is covered with trees and we couldn't measure the property, so we needed to go out and make sure our data was accurate. So we would we do that during the reappraisal process. As opposed to the triennial, we don't go out and do any adjustments. What we are looking at with the triennial is we analyze the sales in the last three years coming up to that triennial year, and then we uh, use the median ratio of what's going on, what's the market trend going on in your area, and then we apply a factor directly to the current value of the property, and then that value would increase depending or decrease depending on what's going on in the market or what's going on with the market. Um, on to the next one. Um, we had a couple questions. I believe, um, Lisa, you had asked about square footage. So I'm gonna kind of go through this a little bit for you. Um, and then I know there'll probably be a ton of questions on this. That's, that's the burning question. <laughs> How do we calculate the square footage? Right. So, so we can explain things... it. So we can explain it well to our to our buyers and our sellers, really. Right. So um, we use exterior dimensions on a property, just like your fee appraisers, right? So they measure the property, and you determine the square footage. You know, um, 30 feet by 50 feet is 1,500 square feet. All of that. Where, where the confusion gets to this is above grade and below grade is really the question to the, all of your questions. Um, so how do I want to explain it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> because split levels and bi-levels are their own animal. So standard appraisal practices, and if you um, are familiar with the URAR, and I have a sample in here, but we'll get to that in a minute, they actually break out the square footage now above grade and below grade. So exactly what that is saying is how we determine the square footage for gross living area above grade and gross living, it's not really gross living area, it's below grade living area, right? Um, not all basements you can live in. Some of them are cellars, some of them don't have basements. There's crawl spaces. Um, so there's definitely a difference between you know, uh, the characteristics of a property depending on what's below grade. So um, here in the county, I believe um, what we do with our bi-levels and split levels, um, you're all familiar with those. Um, there's kind of a partial below grade level on a bi-level or a, where it's partially below grade. Um, that is the only types of properties, dwellings, by levels and split levels, where we will add partial uh, lower level square footage into the total square footage of the property. That is not a standard practice for appraisal. So our county does something a little different because, uh, and I think part of this is the Board of Realtors had gotten involved in, uh, I believe in 14 and 15 when we first, we transferred our CAMA system over and um, the practice typically is, is again, below, below grade and above grade. In our county, our, the Board of Realtors, I know you market the homes as that lower level as living area, so you're marketing a home that way. Unfortunately, the appraisers, even fee appraisers, they break it out totally different. So um, if you would drop, uh, go to the next uh, parcel here. So this, sorry, the, this is pretty blurry to me. I'm not, this yeah, is yeah. the URAR from the appraisal. Um, the typical fee appraisal uh, uh, form, right? And I highlighted these two areas. One says the um, above grade gross living area and the one directly below it is basement and finished below grade finished area. So in this case, um, that's exactly what the fee, the fee appraiser or we do anything above the grade, two stories, both stories are above grade. So we, that would be your above grade square footage. And then anything uh, below grade, we would count. So if it's a ranch or a two story and it has any type of finished basement, it's typically called a rec room. And then we, we count that square footage as below grade. Um, if you'd go to the next slide, I'm hoping it might be a little more clear. So this is a bi-level. And if you look at the by level, it's a really, um, you walk into the front door and then you, there's stairs going down, right? To the right, 
and to the left is the garage. So those are below grade. And then everything above that is the above grade. Now that's how a fee appraiser will break that out on your, on your fee appraisal. Now, the only exception is since this is a buy level in Franklin County, we've added that lower level into your above grade square footage. I know this is confusing, I apologize. Um, what we can talk or answer questions here in a minute. So one more slide down, and it's gonna be hard to see because of the slide here, but as we broke this down, you'll see that this is a buy level and where I highlighted it in the bottom right corner, when you go to your parcels, you need to look at this. It will say finished above grade and finished below grade. If there is a finished below grade, that means it's probably a split level or a buy level, and the total square footage will be the combination of the above and below, but those are that's only in a buy level or a split level. If this house happened to be a two-story and it had a finished rec room, that area where I've highlighted will, will be a zero. The rec room is not counted in, like if it's a, a ranch home with a a rec room in the basement, we only count the above grade into your square footage. I said a lot there, so are there any questions? <laughs> Sorry about that. So when I when I talked with the appraiser, she said exactly what you're saying. It, it's all based on the style of the home as to what can be counted and what can't be counted. So the, the distinctions are the buy levels and the split levels, of course. Um, and then I was also, if you could talk a little bit about like if, you know, there's a lot of people who finish their basements or finish parts of their basements and they try to uh, put bedrooms and things like that down there. Can you talk about what can be counted as livable space, egress, the windows, the size of the windows, if it needs to have a hallway to be counted as a bedroom, all of those kinds of questions are things that I know over the years that I've heard. So there's a, there's a lot there. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it depends on the situation that you're, that you're looking at the property. So as um, let's just take a normal ranch with a basement and they finish the, the basement. There's whether there's a bedroom or anything down there, we classify finished area as a rec room, bedroom, and that would just be all in conference into one square footage. We do not have the ability to break it out in our system like you do on the MLS system to show bedroom counts and, and different room counts. We don't do that. Um, and as you look at the, the URAR, those fee appraisers can't break out, whether it's um, a rec room, they, they'll, they'll call it because your listing states it's a rec room and a bedroom and a bathroom down there. Um, it'll be listed, but in ours, in the, in the county, we will have the square footage as the total rec room. We will value the bathroom. Now, depending on what you call the rooms, whether it's a bedroom, a den or whatever, we don't really do room count down in the basement. Um, the only ones that we do count would be your split levels or your buy levels. We would then add your bedrooms into our counts. Does that help? on some of those questions there? Yes. Um, so I know it's egress windows. So let's think about what an egress really is. An egress window is allowing a firefighter or the, the occupant of the property to escape the building safely. It has nothing to do with adding a window as egress and saying now it's living area, right? It's still below grade it's allowing light in and it's a safety window to allow people out in case of emergencies. It does not add, make the square footage go to the above grade square footage. So is there a size that the window has to be and is there a distance from the floor that it needs to come to? That is not, that's nothing that we require. Um, that's really probably under your city codes of the requirement of what's classified as an egress window. It should be a full size window. My understanding is a firefighter with his tank and everything on should be able to enter that window or exit that area. And that would be an egress window. Your typical basement windows that are, I don't know, 20 inches by 30, that is not an egress window. It's hard to climb out of that, right? Um, but that would be my, my 
uh, definition of an egress window. What about an attic, a finished attic? Okay, so that's another another good question. One of the, the, the first question you need to ask yourself is, is this property, how was it originally designed, right? So, so was this a ranch home that had attics, an attic, but a cubby or what is it called, a scuttle to go up into, and then now they've added some drywall and you have to pull down the stairs and climb up there. Not living area. You have to have full walk up stairs to be counted as an attic area. So you've got to have um, access accessibility to that area. A couple things also you have to have is that area needs to be heated and cooled, right? It needs to um, uh, have plenty of headroom. So a lot of times they're pitched. And so a good height for that is about five to six foot. There's a standard there. Anything below that, you know, like really low, you can't walk in, you have to kind of crawl in. So we only count the area that we can actually stand up in, not hit your head if you're too tall, you know. Um, so about a five and a half foot area uh, is what we count as the finished area of an attic. Um, and again, it needs to be heated at least and cool if, if the AC is there one way or the other. Um, so does that help answer your attic question? Are there any requirements on window size for that? Is it the same as what you mentioned? Um, I've seen them where they're smaller windows, but um, because they're marketed, they're lived that way, you can tell that the property is being lived in and utilized as a full attic area or, or you know, Cape Cods also have um, uh, area up there, half stories. Um, there's no requirement, but typically you would want a window or two um, for, for egress. So I would say you need at least a window up there. Okay, Patrick perfect. had a question. I'm sorry, Troy. Sure. Patrick, you had a question? Yeah, so do you guys, I had a client call me and he had a ranch home with a finished base, or well, I'll call it finished, but it was so badly done um, <laughs> that me personally, I would assign no value to that. I mean, it's literally panel from probably the 60s or 70s that was put up and it has never been touched. Are you guys going through property descriptions on listings and reviewing these to add value? Because like, he had a, a quote rec room and I would have maybe placed a value on that of maybe three dollars a square foot i mean it was so bad it, it's almost not worth anything right. uh, how do you guys do that so really it, it is it is on the taxpayer or property owner to make sure their data is accurate right we don't get into properties so we we count on the the property owners and also the agents and that we do use mls we use um realtor.com and and all the extra um data that we can but it's only when that property sells, if that property has never sold in the last 20, 30 years, and he originally had a finished basement, how would I know that that's changed or the condition of that is changed dramatically enough that it needs to be removed? So have your property owners call us and, and they can show us pictures. We can make that justification. We can actually go do an inspection. We will do home inspections. Um, they haven't been pre prevalent right now because of COVID, but we have inspected homes and we will make changes based on the data that we collect. So will those changes only be done during the time period that they have to dispute the new tax values or is that any time? No, no, just, just call in and, and tell them that you want to discuss. We might be able to just handle it over the phone, but if we think we really need to do an, an actual interior inspection, we would, we would give that uh, them an option for that as well. Or maybe you as the agent can say, hey, this, this basement isn't finished. Here's some photos, right? Show us some pictures that the paneling fall, has fallen off in three of the areas. You can't really live down there. Maybe we can make a, 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 um, a decision based on that information as well. And Lance, can you talk a little bit while well, you mentioned the mass and the try, the annual maintenance sure. work that office does? Sure. So again, we reappraise every six years. 
2017 was our last one. 2023 is our next one. Our triennial just took place in 2020. Each year in between that, we do what's known as annual maintenance slash new construction, I'll call it. So we're tasked to make sure um, new builds that are coming on, we need to go and measure them and add new builds to the tax roll. If uh, folks have taken out additions and put an addition on the backside of their home, we need to pick that up. So annually, we do a lot of maintenance of parcels that are that are changing, right? If there's no permits, if you've not done anything to your home, then you're then we wouldn't be out there to do an inspection or anything. But it's just those that are either selling um, new additions, maybe they're remodeling, taking out permits, making adjustments to the property. We then will do an annual maintenance on those properties and and adjust data accordingly to what we find during that time. Speaking of um, permits, can you talk a little bit about what needs what needs a permit? What you know? What's the what's the what's the threshold there? So, no legal advice. We really don't handle the permits. The city handles the permits. Right. So we re so we reach out to each municipality annually and request all a copy of all the permits from them that they require for whatever requirement. If you're adding something, I think I would recommend my clients to check into it to make sure you do you need a do you need a permit or not. Um, you, you, you know, maybe uh, I would recommend it. Um, and then talk to the city and see what the requirements are. You know, there's some handy men that can do some handy men people, they can take care of this stuff themselves. But my understanding is if it's mechanical changes and you're moving any of the, those, you should have a licensed contractor do that type of work. But if you're just painting your interior home, you don't need a permit. So it really depends on the level of what you're doing and is a permit required. Um, so I would probably reach out to the city um, and the municipalities to, to re understand what their requirements are for those changes. I've got a question, maybe this is more for um, Michael, but you guys are talking about how only in Franklin County you're counting some of this land or some of this value of, of below grade living. You know, we work in Delaware County and, and um, uh, Union County and, and some Licking County, Fairfield, all this stuff. Are, is there some type of like coordination effort with other counties? How, I mean, to keep that consistency there or how, like what's, I guess, is that, kind of more of a Franklin County issue. Uh, well, so there is the Auditors Association, but I will let Lance discuss kind of the discussions he has with the other appraisers. He gets questions from me all the time of, well, they're doing this in this county. Uh, and then he follows up and clarifies for me. So Lance actually right. can speak. So, so um, Patrick, uh, you have to understand whether, even if we didn't collect this and add it to it, we would still be valuing that, that as a rec room or finished area below grade also. So there's a value attributed even in the other counties um, to it. We just, this is how I don't want to say, um, in, I know 14 and 15, I wasn't here at the county. Um, I was a mass appraiser. They changed our process and they were going to do it and, and remove that finished lower level. And my understanding is there were a lot of meetings with the board of realtors that they did not want us to do that. Um, during that process. So uh, as far as a valuing factor, I don't think either way, we're still valuing the property with that lower level, whether we call it a rec room and we put a value on it, or we value it as an above grade area, we are still valuing it the same. Um, it's just we're, we're applying it to the above grade, um, which is added a little confusion. I have no problem we would have to discuss and make sure everybody's in agreement to make that change. But the other counties, um, as long as you understand how the fee appraisers are going to appraise the property, that's the key. And they're going to show this property that I used as the buy level that's on the screen. It's 1,440 square feet above grade and about 500 and some square feet below grade. You should know that as an agent and understand that they're still going to count that. They're going to value it, but they break it out on their on the appraisal form and apply value differences there. Because, like you mentioned, Patrick earlier, you had a gentleman whose finish was below par, 
um, that fee appraiser is going to probably make an adjustment differently depending on the quality of finish of that lower level. Does that answer? Well, your I guess, I, yeah, a little bit, but I guess, you know, if you have a split level, like, so his was a ranch with in, in the basement essentially, but if you have a split level or buy level, you've got kind of half and half and, and that below grade is not going to get the same appraised value as above grade. Am I not, am I correct on that? Well, I just, well, I, I disagree because what I would do as a fee appraiser, I would probably find other buy levels and split levels with the same type of square footage, which would break out in that same report above and below. And if it's, if it's selling for $200,000 and my other sales have those same features, then it's worth $200,000, right? You're c comparing right. apples to apples. So that's, the, that's the, that's where you, that's what you have to focus on. So even when you do a, a CMA, you need to look at, oh, I'm going to look at, especially when it's a split or a buy level, you really need to pay attention to the other splits and buy levels in that market. And that, and, and that, that's the comparables you should be using. It's hard when there's not any, and you're trying to use a two story with a finished basement compared to a buy level, but you're probably at a different level of square footage. Appraisers can do that. What they have to do is they'll break it out and then they really, in their reconciliation of that appraisal, they'll have to break down what they did and how they attributed the basement versus a split levels, lower level in the square footage and how they value it. So those are always a little tougher for the fee appraisers than us, um, but really look at your comparable sales of that same style of property. Okay. Okay. Any other Let's questions? Let's go ahead and let, let you guys get through your presentation because we only have about 15 minutes left. Um, you know, I want to make sure that you're able to get through everything, Michael. Well, so there's only three things and as exciting as property taxes can be, uh, I get the uh, back clean up here, but we recognize where the appraised value is an important conversation you would have with your buyers and sellers. When they get that tax bill, there's a lot of discussion as well. Uh, property owners kind of wondering, was it the appraised value or what's going on? And the way the Ohio law is structured, it's that appraised value with that taxing district that really causes or, or sets the rate um, we work with the treasurer's office and we set the rate, she sends out the bills, uh, but it causes a lot of confusion during a triennial or sexennial uh, process just because you can have situations where your appraised value goes up, taxes can go down, your appraised value could go down, your taxes could go up, or they could change, stay the same. And, and it really is going to depend on what's happening within your triennial neighborhood and within that taxing district. Uh, we are lucky that we have 140 some taxing districts. Uh, I'll show a map pretty soon. Uh, but what we would get a lot during the try is I can't believe you're increasing my uh, property tax 20%. And it is not a one for dollar $1 for one dollar equivalent. Uh, of the appraised value, 30% of that value is then what we use with that taxing district to set that property tax rate. Um, and, and so the effective rate is determined using pretty much the simplistic equation, but given all the different taxing districts, we get a lot of confusions. And then that doesn't include homestead exemptions or other um, exemptions that exist under Ohio law. Um, so with the 149 taxing districts, they're spread all out, uh, depending what part of uh, neighborhood community you live in, that will play a impact. What I think will be key for you all is that first three digits of a parcel will be that taxing district. Um, so if you have clients uh, that are wondering, where am I at? You can always email us. We're happy to answer the question, but you also might be able to make that determination based on uh, those first three digits. Uh, but it, it's simple when we're in, in the throes of the office every day, but we recognize when people get those property tax bills or when they're trying to make a purchase and wanna know, well, what's my property tax uh, impact going to be? Um, those are the factors that come into play. We are in board of revision season. Uh, our BOR team's referring to it as March Madness. We have a hard March 31st deadline. So any clients you have that may want to contest uh, their property value, so what, uh, our appraisers went out, set the value. If they had participated in the informals, got a no change or felt maybe the informals should have taken more things into account, the Board of Revision is the place to do it. 
Um, we have created a online portal, so it couldn't be any easier to submit your uh, form. Uh, it gets done, you'll get uh, notified immediately that it's been accepted versus going through the mail. But Board of Revision, it's the auditor, the treasurer, Board of Commissioners, opportunity to come forward, show photos, add additional information. Uh, as Lance mentioned in the try, they were really just more spreadsheet oriented. It wasn't going out and viewing each parcel. Uh, so if there is an outdated kitchen or there was damage in the basement, the BOR is the place to do that. If it's a $50,000 change or less that they are looking to uh, see, uh, you'll likely end up in the mediation program. If it is over that $50,000 threshold, we do have to notify whatever school districts sit in and that school district may decide to become a party to uh, the complaint. And so that's one thing to keep in mind. But because it's a great bite at the apple, even after the informals through the triennial, uh, after March 31st, there won't be another window to contest till next, till December of this year. So this is the right time if you've got clients wondering to do that. Like Only how long does that take if they do contest? How long does it take? If it is the mediation program, it should take about less than a month, so about three weeks. Um, if it is through the formal BOR, and depending whether or not the school district, that extends out because the school district gets 30 days to respond. Uh, so that can take anywhere to three to four months. Uh, we encourage you to go ahead, pay their property taxes, and then if there is a difference, we would then give them that check down the road. Um, but encourage people, if they feel the value is incorrect, please, please uh, go through the Board of Revision. That deadline is next week. We have been holding virtual filing events. So traditionally, the Board of Revision team would be at a library, a community center, post it up there all day with printers, print out the form, help uh, property owners fill them out. Because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do that. But on the uh, Auditor Cinziano, Michael Cinziano Facebook page, we have taped segments where we've been doing it weekly since January of how to fill out the forum tips and tricks. Um, so encourage anyone to do that. If there are questions on the border revision process, feel free to email the team, which I believe is BOR at franklincountyauditor.gov. There is pending legislation in the General Assembly. So one thing that's been frustrating on my end, hence we ask on the Auditors Association, if there was a tornado or a flood that impacted your property, we have a form through the state that we can go update the property so you can reflect that maximum value or what you're not able to maximize. Pandemic, there's an economic tornado that hit a lot of property owners, mainly commercial, uh, but depending how you use uh, or, or what you feel the value of your property is. And the revised code has been silent to that. And so uh, was talking to members of the General Assembly today that it looks like they will put forward an opportunity to open that BOR window again. Uh, so we will do our best to communicate to folks out what the General Assembly has accounted for, but it would allow for account putting in the form where uh, COVID government orders and shutdowns have impacted um, properties uh, maximizing the values. But if you do have a damage or destroyed property, there's a lot of rain tonight and basement floods, uh, contact our office and we can work and get it updated. And then finally, the other big piece, along with making sure we have as many bathrooms uh, and bedrooms in our website, people want updated photos. Uh, so the Cyclomedia team is going out and updating photos. It takes about three months, uh, but they are gonna be cruising around Franklin County and updating any client's photos. So if you have any clients that say, oh, it's an outdated photo, Get that auditor to update it. It's coming um, and feel free to pass that information along to them. I know I talked quickly, but I think Jamie and Lance uh, were really the best meat on the bones of the presentation. Always feel free to email me, Auditor Stenziano at frankcountyohio.gov or call the office 614-525-HOME. With that, that is our presentation. We still are happy to answer any additional questions you have. I do have a question. Um... And then I'll let every I'll shut up and let everybody else ask their questions. Market value. How do you come up with your market value? Because obviously your market value is very different than our market value. And then also, how do you come up with the tax value? Can it? Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I'm going to let Lance do the market versus appraised value because um, I 
give him a hard time or some of his staff a hard time of what gets listed and what we have in our uh, appraised value. Okay, so the market value. Something you have to think about on, on ad valorem tax appraising is the reappraisal and then the time frame of our date of that appraisal value that you're looking that you're looking at. For example, um, 2020 just happened. Our appraised value was as of 1 1 2020. So technically, that's a year, almost a year and three month old value, right? So that was based on on the data prior to the pandemic. That, that value reflects prior to that. So the month after, the way the market is right now, our value could be higher or lower depending on what the market's doing. So if the market turns the other direction, values could go down. We just happen to be in a spike right now that values are going up. So you can market and sell your property probably higher than what the auditor's value is because again, ours is, 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 is valued as of that date. Here's the other thing you have to think about. If that property owner makes no changes to that property for the next three years until the next reappraisal, that value is going to remain the same, right? And in three years from now, if the market's still hot, that value would be higher. That value is for tax purposes. Now, what could change is, is let's say 2021, the value stays the same, but there was a levy that was voted on in that particular area. And yes, we made no changes to the property value, but the tax rate then, tax rates adjust every year at the end of the year. The state comes out with new tax rates. So even though there was no value change on that property, the rate changed. And so those taxes could go up or down also. So it depends on, so you gotta be careful and you have to think about the value and what, what our value is and what time frame are we in the cycle of reappraisal. Um, so understand that a property value doesn't change every year. We don't. Ours holds for three years as long as there's been, you know, no improvements, no sales, no permits taken out, any of those type of things. Then the property could be reass reassessed or relooked at as part of our annual maintenance. But if they've done nothing, it will stay the same value if nothing's changed for three years and the taxes could go up or down depending on what the tax rates do. And then to piggyback on the piece about the tax equation. So we have our appraised value that 35% then gets combined with the taxing district. The taxing district is going to be based on the bonds and levies of that uh, community has supported. So one thing a lot of people seem surprised by when their property value went up, but also we had approved last primary election, a new bond. It wasn't substantial, but it resulted in an increase uh, in the probably 95% of uh, property taxes. Uh, so the Columbus State bond issue gets added. It was a uh, bond that did not exist before in tax calculation purposes. And so now that that was added, that created an increase uh, for owners. And so we, on the website and on the property tax bill, there should be uh, a breakdown of where the property taxes are going. The largest portion is the school district. Uh, but we are very lucky in Franklin County. We pay for Metro Parks. We play for the Columbus Zoo, uh, now Columbus State. A lot of entities that other uh, counties get the benefit from, uh, we carry the freight of that. And so depending where they are in their cycle, on their bond or levy, that also will play a role. So the rumors Columbus State is looking to potentially go back to the ballot uh, for another levy. That may play a role and impact even in the next three-year cycle of what people's property taxes will look like. Patrick is not a fan of Columbus. I, you, it's a state school. You've got one county paying for the entire school. It's a, don't get me started on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a state school. Every county should be paying for it because it doesn't matter if you're in Cleveland or if you're in Cincinnati, you can send your kid to Columbus State and pay in-state rates. Right. But they went to the General Assembly and the General Assembly let them do it and Franklin County got to pay for it. Property owners. We're not going to get political here. We're here to talk about <laughs> tax appraisals. <laughs> okay. So quick question on the, on the appraised value. So you mentioned that's the value as of 1120. 
So when you got what data, are you using data from the previous three years in totality or are you weighting it based on when the sale was or how does that calculation work? Great question. So yes, so we analyze sales every year as they, as they progress. Sales we usually look at, uh, so we're looking at 2020 sales now. We do what's called sales review. We analyze, we look at it and look for um, information that's incorrect. Maybe they do have a finished basement, maybe we don't. It transferred, so why did that house all of a sudden sell for what it sold for and our data is not reflective of it? So we make some changes there. But when we do the reappraisal, yes, we weight it. So again, it depends on the market, right? We have a three-year window. Um, and so this past triennial, we looked at um, sales from, what is 18, 19, or sorry, 17, 18, and 19. The market has been hot all three years. We put the most weight at the end of the, the year, the tax, the, sorry, the transfers that happen closest to the effective date of that appraisal kind of like fee, right? You guys go back, they go back six months. We analyze them all, we review them all, but we do weight the newer sales closest to the effective date as our, our the most, the best indication of value. They're weighted higher, yes. Does that and answer your question? Indication of value, we will lean on a recent sale as exempt or, or, or showing that this is the value that it could be. So a lot of homeowners get upset where our value is one thing, they purchased it substantially higher, and now that's what we're setting it as. Uh, Ohio Supreme Court says that uh, recent sale value is an appropriate measurement. Um, so if you get clients that get upset by that, feel free to send them our way. We'll explain the, the court uh, ruling. So did, did I hear you say that you guys do have the ability or you sometimes do adjust in between those triennial, triennial reviews? Yeah, that's part of our annual maintenance that we would, that we discussed. So permits, um, any of that type of stuff or a transfer or anything that changed that property, we can re-look at to make sure our data is accurate. So we have a ton of remodeling and rehabbing going on and, and gentrification in a lot of these areas. A lot of folks are not taking permits out right now. So we analyze these sales for data as well. We might not have received the permit that they totally remodeled that house, but that sale told us, hey, something's happened. We had it at 150,000 and it sells for 250. Something's had to happen to that property in the time frame. They didn't pull a permit. We can't verify it that way. We don't see an addition, but it transferred. So we then will re review, um, you know, realtor.com, MLS, all of those features to look for data that maybe we want to make sure that the that the data is accurate. If you really read the Ohio Revised Code, it is on the, the on the property owner to make sure they inform us of all changes and things to their property, um, and and to, so that we can everybody is taxed fairly and equally, right? So if you know the neighbor next door just added a a huge addition, they've pulled a permit, they did the work themselves. It, they're not being taxed equitably to everybody else. So there are features in our annual maintenance that we do look for changes and processes um, and data is the most important thing. Um, if our data is wrong, then our values are wrong. And, and we, we are striving every year since um, the auditor Senziaio came into uh, to office a couple of years ago, we're really focusing now on our data, data interior, in, for interior and exterior. We're really focusing because we want to make sure we do this right, we have the right information, and we rely on you as agents to give a lot of that information to us because we don't get into the properties. So we don't know what's been there, what's being changed. So um, that information is very helpful to us. So that value could be adjusted. Like let's say a home sold in December 30th of last year theoretically their tax value for 2021, which will come out at the end of this year, Correct. would could could adjust, even it though could. it's not a triennial review. That, that is a correct, that's true, yes. And their taxes could adjust as well, because it's based, that's a form. Because it's based on that, yes. Okay. Yes. Is that something that's always been done, or is that something that was part of revised code because I swear that I, and I know this has nothing to do with you guys, but previous administrations, 
I thought had said something different than that. Uh, no, we review every year, all the sales each year as part of our annual maintenance. So, so it's think, always been the, that way or? I think the nuances, the office used to always call it as, uh, what, what was the language? I New that, construction. It was always the new construction letter. So annually they sent out a new construction letter. And I was just seeing person after person say, I didn't do any new construction. And it was, so we have reframed it and calling it annual maintenance, but it is something that all auditors are mm -hmm. doing across the state, not just in Franklin County. But that, the term art that's new from new construction to annual. You cut out there for a second. You yeah. cut out there for a second. Yeah, so just, that's the term of art that really has changed outside of that, that the practice has been consistent. Yeah. Gotcha. There's been no change to that. Does anybody else have any questions before we let him go? Because we're running over a little bit and I don't want to run into anybody else's appointments. Well, Michael, thank you so, so much. Lance, thank you so much. Um, I can't remember what you're, and Jamie, uh, the other lady Jamie. in the beginning. <laughs> Jamie, sorry, sorry, it's Jamie. A lot. Can you think Thank about you so much. Jamie put in in the beginning to where we're ending. There's a lot in there. And so if you guys have additional questions, please, please let us know. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for coming and, and sharing all of your great knowledge. Um, and you guys, I, I do have the, the, the printout. So if you want to email me, um, I can, or I can, post this in our group and, and put the files in there as well. Thank you so much, everybody. You guys have a great day. Michael, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.